Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that, Lord God, that you'd bless it to us, Lord. I pray that as we study your word this morning, that, Father God, that, Lord, you, Lord, would just speak to our hearts and minds. And, Father, I ask that, Lord God, that we would learn more of you this morning. Father, I pray that, Lord, through the study of your word, that, Lord, our hearts would be drawn ever closer to you. I pray that, Lord God, that, Lord, you would stir us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, in this reading this morning, we've looked at the manna from heaven. Now, in this particular chapter, the children of Israel are complaining that there's a lack of food. And... There are two provisions. There's one of manna, and the second is the provision of quail. And what we find here is one is a supernatural, miraculous provision. The other is miraculous, but it is more providential provision of food, in that God has engineered this miracle through natural means. Now, the natural means of the provision of the quail is basically that God has directed this migration of quail. Apparently, um, quail migrate around the Sinai and all these desert areas on a yearly basis. So some would argue, well, this is a natural phenomena. This is a natural occurrence. And we know that God can use natural occurrences in his work. He can manipulate um, the weather, he can manipulate natural occurrences within, within the world. And that is fine. However, with the provision of the manna, this was a supernatural, miraculous provision which had nothing to do with anything pertaining to this earth. And that is why it's referred to as the manna from heaven. And people have speculated that it could be uh, this particular seed or that particular plant or this particular substance which has come from the earth. Now, what plant do you know of that can grow or be provided for just six days? And then on the uh, uh, sixth day, it, its quantity is doubled, but then on the seventh day, there's none. You know, just by, by that example alone, we can see here that that basically disqualifies man's notions that this was an, a, a manipulation of something natural. The provision of manna from heaven was supernatural. It was a supernatural miracle from God. Now, the manna in the wilderness, there is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't have his origins from an earthly perspective. Christ basically pre-existed before he came to this earth. He is the man which came down from heaven. And in this particular chapter, in Exodus chapter 16, we read that the children of Israel, within the first month of leaving Egypt, had been tested with regards to their need of water. And now they're being tested with regards to their need of food. They've had to leave Elam, which was supposed to have been a restful uh, place of refreshing, an oasis in the harsh desert. However, this wasn't a permanent resting place. They had to move on. They had to keep going forward as the Lord led them. And you know, as Christians, I don't believe that God wants us to be too comfortable with this world. We are sojourners, we are pilgrims, we are travellers, just passing through. God doesn't want us to be too comfortable with this life, with this world. The true hope of all believers is not what we can get out of this world, but rather the soon appearing of our Lord from heaven, and our translation then into heaven with the Lord. However, this short stay at Elim is like our initial entrance into the Christian faith from the world. In other words, Egypt. It is all spiritual elation and joy to begin with as we bask in our newfound relationship with the Lord. And as newborn babes in Christ, there is a heightened hedge of protection and there is an acute presence of the Lord 
for a time. But then, just as new chicks in a nest have to learn to fly, the testing and the exposure to difficult times intensifies and becomes more frequent as we are taught to grow in our faith, as that faith is tested more and more. You see, God doesn't want us to be too comfortable. and God doesn't want us to become stagnant. God wants our characters to be developed. He wants us to be strengthened. He wants us to grow. And that can only come about through testing, whether we like it or not. The Apostle Peter was able to say, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the appearing, uh, the appearance, the appearing of the Lord Jesus and so it is with the children of Israel. They have to leave behind a momentary place of rest, this place of Elam, this oasis. And they have to enter into further testing from the Lord. And they enter what is called the wilderness of sin, or in some translations, zin with a Z. Now, the wilderness of sin doesn't mean sin as in wrongdoing. The word here in the Hebrew language actually means thorn. Therefore, it was the wilderness of thorn, or it was a thorny, barren wilderness. It indicates its dryness, its barrenness, its unfruitfulness. And you know, a thorn is actually a plant's aborted attempt at bearing fruit. And I'm sure that you'd agree, a thorny plant, it can cause harm and pain to anyone that is caught by it or in it. A thorn also reminds us of the curse which has come about by Adam's sin, as we read that concerning the ground becoming cursed with thorns in Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord Jesus Christ was mockingly forced to wear a crown of thorns, which unbeknown to the Romans, symbolised that Jesus would become a curse for us by dying on the tree. The Apostle Paul was tested and kept humble from pride by an ailment which he referred to as being like a thorn in his side. And therefore, although the intention of the name is for something else, this wilderness does, however, depict very well the effects of sin. The sin that can harm us and keep us entangled in a place of unfruitfulness for God. And yet, it was in this place and in this condition that God, in his loving mercy was to send them bread from heaven, which we later learn to be a type, a type of God sending forth his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, from heaven to save and to rescue us from sin. We hear for the children of Israel, as their need of food intensifies, and no sustenance can be seen with a natural sight, what do they do? What do they do as typical humans, something that we would do if we were in that situation? They began to quickly forget the miraculous departure out of Egypt. They quickly forget the miracles that God had brought about in their sight. They forget all these previously witnessed things that God had done for them. All these things fade in their memory. And they hankered after the foods that had been available there in Egypt. 
What do they do as a result? They start looking back. They start longing for Egypt. Can you imagine that? They'd been in slavery. They'd been in torturous conditions for all those years there in Egypt. And here in the desert, they start hankering after the things of Egypt again. They're longing to go back. And you know, church, there's much back in Egypt which would seek to entice us to return. And with a natural eye, it may even be presented to us as a more plausible and beneficial decision. However, all the pleasures that Egypt has to offer are only fleeting in comparison to eternity. And they can never replicate exactly all of the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. But we fool ourselves into thinking that it's better if we go back. We like to revisit Egypt from time to time. We hear the children of Israel began to criticise and grumble against Moses and Aaron. Also forgetting that these men were only following the instructions, the directions from God. Therefore, the children of Israel, again, were looking at things in a lateral perspective. And as a result, they were inadvertently grumbling and criticizing God. Moses and Aaron tell the people in verse 8, For the Lord hears your complaints, which you make against him. And what are they? And what are we? For your complaints are not against us, but they are against the Lord. You see, the people were grumbling against uh, Moses and Aaron. But like I said, inadvertently, they were grumbling against the Lord. Now, some will try and use this verse to claim that we must blindly follow church leaders and not question or challenge something that we may disagree with. And that is not true. We are to judge all things with the mind of Christ and test all things against the word of God to see if it be correct and true. Here, however, the children of Israel were basing their complaints on an assumption that they would starve, that God was going to bring them to this place to starve to death. They were therefore not only prematurely accusing the Lord of not taking care of them, but they were also twisting their memory of the experiences of Egypt by only focusing on the small percentage of pleasure that they gained there. You know, in our times of weakness and temptation, it's so easy to forget or to, if you like, refocus our minds away from all the abundant blessings and spiritual blessings of God for that small percentage of pleasure we get out of sin. And this is what the children of Israel were doing here. They were hankering after the things of Egypt, which they would have only experienced in a small percentage. They were slaves. They conveniently left out the fact that they were slaves in a foreign land and had been subjected to many hardships and sufferings. They conveniently left all that out and focused on the small percentage of enjoyment that they had. And such is the convenient memory of those that want to grumble and complain and win their side of the argument or even try and justify why they want to go back into Egypt. Such is the convenient memory. And such is the heart of sinful man, both Jew and Gentile alike. And unfortunately, until we see Christ face to face, that is the enmity that we face every 
day because the spirit is at war with the flesh and the flesh at war with the spirit from the moment we wake up until the, the day we uh, die, basically, or that moment where we see Christ face to face. We are in a constant battle with these things. And yet, we see next, not the Lord rebuking or chastening the children of Israel, which he had every right to do so, but he spoke to Moses in the Shekinah glory, in the cloud of glory, and he promised that they would have meat and bread to eat by the next morning. It amazes me, the grace of God, how the grace of God is poured out upon his people, even when we don't deserve it. And that's why the psalmist was able to say in Psalm 103, he said, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Church, I praise God for all of his long suffering, all of his patience with us. I praise God for all of his grace, which none of us deserve. Yet in his love, he lavishes it upon us. And in his love, he has saved us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he has lavished his love upon us. You see, a true work of grace in the hearts of God's children should produce a quiet faith and appreciation of all that the Lord has done and can do. Yet it takes time. It takes time for the person fresh out of Egypt to fully appreciate and understand this. While faith for salvation comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Faith and spiritual growth and development in our daily lives, therefore, has to increase by way of testing, by being tried and tested by way of experience as we seek to put God's word into practice day by day. You see, knowledge doesn't equate to wisdom. Although you need knowledge in order to grow wiser, but wisdom comes through the practice of that knowledge. And the Lord said to Moses in verse 5 that the people were to gather a specific quota every day, every day that he may test them whether they walk in his law or not. You see, the Ten Commandments, the law given on Mount Sinai had not yet been given to them. And the Lord was using this as a test. They to go out every day and gather in a certain quota of this manner. It is a test to see how they will respond to my instruction. A test to see how obedient they'll be to my commands. There are many that have departed Egypt, and yet they have neglected to walk according to God's word. They leave Egypt and continue living as though they are still in Egypt. The Lord will test his people and test the genuineness of their faith, but also so that we are stretched in our spiritual lives and character. James chapter 1 tells us, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing it's part of our growth and our maturity in God the Hebrews 5 tells us for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those 
who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I'm so glad that the Bible tells us that we grow in both the knowledge and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as well as knowledge, grace is most definitely needed in my life and in all of our lives. We need God's grace because I tell you what, we mess up every single day. Grace is most definitely needed. No wonder the hymn writer was able to say, through many dangers, toils and snares, we have already come. Twas grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. The children of Israel are instructed by God through Moses to go out daily, daily and gather the manna. However, on the sixth day, they were to gather twice as much in order to rest on the seventh day. To rest on the seventh day. This not only caters for a Sabbath day rest, but it is also a type of the fact that there will be very little rest, if you like, leading up to that final day of salvation there will be no toil in heaven when we get to heaven when we get there i hope we will hear those words well done my good and faithful servant enter now into your rest there'll be no toil in heaven however our labor our work leading up to the day of the lord the Bible says will intensify more and more until the Lord returns. So on the sixth day, they were to gather in twice as much so that they could then rest on the seventh. This is a type, if you like, of what is happening with our world leading up to the return of the Lord. The days will become more and more evil and our labour for the Lord will increasingly become harder and harder. Our witness for God will become harder and harder. Our testing will become more and more severe. And in light of this, I thank God that he tells us through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. In other words, stand strong. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Praise God for that. Whatever we do for the Lord, however intense it is, however tired we become, However battle-weary we become, church is not done in vain in the Lord. The gathering of the manna was to be done early in the morning because by midday, the Bible says, it melted away. You see, it was based on God's terms. The gathering of this manna wasn't to be connected with the people saying, I'll go out when I want to to gather the manna when I feel like it, there were stipulations around this. It had to be done early in the morning because by midday, this manna, it melted away. And spiritually, this speaks to us of a determination and a due diligence to seek the word of God and be filled for the remainder of what lies ahead for that day. It's no good putting on your battle armor before you get into bed. The day is gone. The day's gone. We have to be prepared for what lies ahead. Procrastination in the things of God will lead to us being ill-equipped to face the world and we'll be undernourished and spiritually weak. God was testing his people. You go out 
early in the morning to gather in this manner. Any later than that, and you'll be gone. You've missed your opportunity. And Isaiah 50 verse 4 declares, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak. A word in season to him who is weary. For he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. You know, sadly, many saints of God wake in the morning and don't think about God until bedtime. And there's that quick fire prayer to God before they get into uh, bed in order to appease their conscience. I've been there, I've done it. But it's such a waste to experience a full day without seeking the Lord. Yet many in the church spend days, weeks, months, and even years doing this. We try and fit God into our busy schedules, forgetting that it is in him we live and move and have our being. It's because of him we have breath in our bodies. It's because of him we are able to do what we can do and to go where we go. Yeah, we forget about him until that last few moments before we get into bed. Church is not religion that we should be practicing or preaching here. It's a relationship. It is a relationship. And our hearts for God should be reflected in the way we seek for God and yearn for God and desire God. Do we desire him early in the morning when we awake? Life is but just like a vapor of steam. It's short and it goes quickly. What a shame to get to a point in old age and regret so much wasted life without the Lord's fellowship. But you may say, ah, but the Lord never leaves me nor forsakes me. He's always with me. And to that I say, I totally agree with you. However, the Bible says we have to draw near to God. And we have to draw near to him with our hearts and seek fellowship and direction. And for this reason, the Lord says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And we also need to be reminded that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And yet we go throughout our lives, a full day, a full week, a full month, like I said, for some Christians, years without even approaching God's word, without even seeking his face, without having that desire to be close to God and have that relationship with him. What a travesty. The psalmist was able to say in Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God, and early I will seek you. And in Proverbs 8, it tells us, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early, they shall find me. For those that have not yet been born again, those that are procrastinating in their decision even to accept Christ, also one day it'll be too late. That opportunity will be gone. Just like that manna that melted away by midday. The opportunity to be saved will be missed. It'll be gone forever. Oh, I'll do it later. I'll go and... Um, I'll go and deal with that later, later in my life. I've got plenty of time. Church, we are not promised tomorrow. My friends, you may think I'll put off until tomorrow or next week or next month before I make that decision to accept Christ as my saviour. 
Do you not promise tomorrow? I'll never, ever forget that lady in Darren Lass that I witnessed to on the door. And she said to me before she closed the door with a smile on her face, I'm all right, love. I don't need it. I got plenty of time to think about that. She died that day. I, I'll, I'll never, ever forget that lady saying those words to me and then learning the next day that she had died in the night. She thought she had all her life ahead of her. I'll make a decision for Christ another time. But another time never came for her. And you may think, you may sit there and you may think, oh, well, that's fear tactics. That's preaching fear into us. I'd rather preach fear and get you into heaven than you miss that opportunity and go to hell, a lost eternity without Christ. That manna, it melted away by midday. And I'm sure that there would have been men and women and children out in that plain, in that wilderness, looking for the manna and thinking, it's gone. It's too late. I've missed it. I should have listened to the instruction to go out early and gather it. And I'm sure that there have been many countless thousands that nearly became Christians before they died. But nearly isn't good enough. Being nearly saved means you are not saved. Nearly saved cannot save you. And just like King Agrippa in Acts chapter 28, who said to the Apostle Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Almost persuaded me. What a travesty to pass from this scene of time into eternity, having almost or nearly been saved. And finding that almost and nearly wasn't enough. The Bible says that we are to seek the Lord while he may be found. For today is the day of salvation. My friend, if you are not saved, you've not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you be in this room or whether you be watching it on YouTube, wherever you may be. If you have not yet made that decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, tomorrow may be too late. They went out seeking the manna and he was gone. The opportunity was missed. This bread from heaven had to be sought early in the morning. And it tells us in verse 13 that in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. <coughs> so when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And that is where we get the word manna from. The word manna. The Semitic word means, what is it? Manha, what is it? And the dew that covered the earth is a type of the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit in the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ in his incarnation. And Mary was told, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. The quiet and silent uh, power of the Holy Spirit, though quiet and silent in its descent, was powerful and life-giving nonetheless. When the dew had lifted, what was revealed was the manna from heaven, which was like a small round substance, not square, or angular, or irregular in its shape, but round, which speaks of endless perfection and completeness. 
My friends, this morning I declare to you from the Bible that the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the perfect Son of God. He is the perfect man from heaven, sinless and perfect. And in verse 31, it tells us that this manna was like white coriander seed. And yet the taste of it was like wafers which were made with honey. Coriander is a bitter herb. It's one of the herbs which is used in the Passover um, celebration. Coriander is a bitter herb. And yet the seed, like manna, was white and it tasted as sweet as wafers made with honey. And this speaks to us of the dualistic effect of the word of God. It is both bitter in that it exposes and judges and deals with sin. And yet it is sweet in that it provides the antidote to that bitterness of sin. In the way of forgiveness, reconciliation, salvation, and eternal life. You see, God's word is both bitter and sweet. And that is why, as Christians, the Apostle Paul says that to some, we are an aroma of life. To others, we are an aroma of death. <clears throat> Jeremiah was able to say in chapter 15, your words were found, and I ate them. Likewise, we read of something similar with Ezekiel in chapter 3. If we turn to Ezekiel for a moment. In Ezekiel chapter 3 from verses 1, it says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give to you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. And in Revelation chapter 10, if we turn to Revelation and from verse 8, <coughs> Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat, and it will make your stomach bitter. But it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Church, the word of God is a double-edged sword. It has that dualistic effect. And we must embrace the word of God in its entirety. Sadly, there are many Christians only looking for the sweetness. And they're shunning that which is uh, causing the bitter effect. But we need both. It's a double-edged sword. Unless we are grieved in our heart over sin, we will not appreciate or experience the grace and the renewing and sanctifying power of God. It's a double-edged sword, and we have to embrace it in its entirety, whether that be to bless us or to chastise us. Sweet as honey or bitter as coriander. I thank God in my life for both. He's had to chastise me many times. But I praise God that that sweetness of honey of his word comes after and it restores. And yet the children of Israel, first thing they said, 
what is it? What is it? Even though God had prepared them in advance and said, I will provide manna, I will provide bread from heaven for you. As soon as they saw it, they said, what is it? John chapter 1 verse 10 tells us concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. What is it? Also in Luke 24, we read of the two men on the road to Emmaus, despite the fact that they walked along the road with um, the resurrected Jesus, they didn't recognize him until their eyes were spiritually opened. In verse 16, it tells us that their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Yet, after Jesus had expounded to them from the word, from beginning with all the prophets from Moses, after he had expounded to them from the Old Testament scriptures and showed them all the things pertaining to himself, he sat down with them and what did he take? He took bread and he broke that bread with them and it tells us that their eyes were opened. And at that moment they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Friends, you may think that you know all about Jesus, but you need to know him personally. You need to come to know him personally and have your eyes opened by him and be in a place of fellowship where you break bread personally with him. That intimate place of relationship and fellowship with Christ. The Bible tells us that until we come to Christ, we are spiritually blind and incapable of understanding the, the spiritual things of God. Until the Holy Spirit indwells us and opens up our eyes to him so that we can see. Until that time, we're in a place of darkness. Even though we may assume that we know all things. I've met people and they've said to me, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. I went to Sunday school and I went to chapel all my life. And you ask them, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And it's a good day and the door is closed. We may assume that we know all things in our pre-Christian state. But listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says tells us a passage of scripture I know that most of us here know all too well. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and from verse 7, we read this. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ye heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, this is what we need to take note of, church, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For we, sorry, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. In church, we have the mind of Christ because the Holy Spirit dwells within us and we have access to the living word of God. Likewise then, the children of Israel, when they saw the manna, despite it already being foretold to them, despite them being told to expect it, they still failed to recognize it when it came down from heaven. Did not the religious rulers of Israel also fail to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, who was to come from heaven? They had the word of God, and yet they failed to recognize the word made flesh. John chapter 5, uh, from verse 38, it tells us this. But you do not have his word abiding in you. Because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. What a travesty. They were the custodians of God's word. They had all of the scriptures which testified of Christ. They knew the scriptures back to front. There was no excuse. Yet when the Messiah came, they failed to recognize him. And they rejected him. And Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them they testify of me, but you will not come to me that you may have life. You can read this from cover to cover. You can go to every Sunday school in the land, but you need to personally accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to come to him of whom the scriptures speak of, that you may have life. Religion and head knowledge cannot and will not save you. We can be as religious and knowledgeable as we like, but that doesn't mean that we are saved. We have to recognize our need of salvation in and through Christ alone. There are also many that when presented with the Lord Jesus, they find that he doesn't meet with their expectations or how they want him to be. And again, we hear those words. What is this? What is this? This is not what I want. This is not what I need. There are many today saying that about Christ. The children of Israel were to gather a certain quota each day according to each one's need. And miraculously, no one had too little or too much. You see, church, Jesus Christ, he is the all-sufficient one. He is the all-sufficient one. You cannot have too little of him, and you cannot have too much of him if you are a true partaker of Christ, for we are given the Spirit without measure. That moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are baptized by and in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is poured out upon us without measure. This supernatural provision of manna from heaven sustained them, you know, for 40 years throughout their journey 
through the wilderness. You know, Christ will sustain us. Christ will keep us until that day. That work which Christ has begun in us, he will see it unto completion until that day. He is the bishop and overseer of our souls. He won't let us down. He kept them for 40 years in that wilderness journey. Every day the manna was provided for them. And likewise, church, God will keep and sustain us through our journey, even at times of wanderings astray. Israel wandered in the desert. They didn't always keep to the course that God wanted. They wandered astray. But God still provided that manna for them every single day. When we are faithless, he remains faithful. According to Numbers 11, we read that the children of Israel became tired of just eating the manna. They demanded meat. And therefore, the reason behind the provision of quail, these birds, was because the people were no longer satisfied with the manna from heaven. Is that you and I this morning? Have we become tired and dissatisfied and bored with the bread from heaven? Does he no longer satisfy you? Is there us this morning? Have we become tired of Jesus? Have we become dissatisfied with his word? Have we said in our hearts, it's not enough? We want something extra as well? Well, The children of Israel grumbled and they complained. And as a result, the Lord gave them, it tells us in Numbers 11, the Lord basically said to them, I will give you, I will give you so much quail that it will come out of your nostrils and make you sick. Be careful what we ask for. Be careful what we ask for. (coughs) Be careful if you have become dissatisfied with Christ alone. It'll come out of your nostrils and become loathsome to you. In other words, in some translations, it'll make you sick. And because they complained about the manna from heaven, the Lord tells us, that as a result, they despised him. He provided supernaturally every single day for them to sustain them with that manna from heaven. And what did the human heart do in response? They got bored of it and they despised him. Likewise then, church, when we become weary and dissatisfied with the word of God, which is synonymous with being dissatisfied with the Lord, you become sick and tired of that. You become sick and tired of him. You cannot divorce the two. We read in Numbers 11 that a disease spread amongst the people of Israel while the quail was still in their teeth. That's that's what it says. Numbers 11, the quail was still in their teeth and a disease spread amongst them. Many scholars believe that the disease may have been carried by the quail. You see, God can use things in our lives in this world to providentially bless us, but he can also use those things to providentially chastise us too. Be careful what we ask for. And this therefore teaches us that when we seek to replace the Lord and his word for something else, it will be to our detriment. Are we satisfied with Christ this morning and him alone? In church, we need to be careful what we ask for, like I said, especially if it distracts us from the bread of heaven, especially in these days. Let us therefore never tire of the word of God, nor the word made flesh, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we never, ever seek to replace him in our fellowship or 
in our lives. I'll continue this study the next time I speak and we'll look at the antitype of this in John chapter 6. Thank you.